you got your Bibles or smartphones, you can kind of get a head start and uh, head over to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy is the fourth book in the Bible, so if you don't know where it is, just start at the beginning and start kind of thumbing your way through. But maybe you're thinking today, okay, Ryan, uh, sounds great, catchy title, but what is it? You know, it's a word that uh, is hard to describe. It's hard to define what it is because you and I, we can't, we can't see it. It's that kind of invisible thing that, that causes us to sit up, to take notice, that kind of invisible thing that draws us in a little bit. Like when we're around it, we notice. Like we feel it. The atmosphere around it is just different, and when we leave it, we are better because of it. When we talk about it in this series, this is what we are talking about. It's that indescribable thing that is invisible to the eye, but visible to the heart. And it convinces us that the presence of God is there. You know, a person can have it, a family can have it, a business can have it, a church can have it, even a nation can have it. And my guess is, is that maybe there's a few of you here today that there was a time in your life when you had it, a time in your life when there was a, a hunger and a passion for God, a time in your life when your heart broke for the things that break God's heart, a time in your life when you leveraged your life, you leveraged your influence, you leveraged your resources for the purposes of God, but then guess what happens? Life happens. Life kind of comes and gets in a way, and over time, it starts to fade away. Well, today is the perfect Sunday for you if that is you. We're going to talk about today uh, from this title, Don't Lose It. Don't lose it. Hey, turn to two people, tell them, don't lose it. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. Hey, I don't know if you, um, if you know this or not, but uh, scientists say that there are at least 27 different emotions that, um, that you and I feel throughout our life. I think personally that one of the, uh, the worst emotions that we feel out of the 27 is the emotion of regret. You know, there's two types of regret. There's the kind of regret where we look back into the rearview mirror of our lives and we see the mistakes and the things that we did that have then altered our life in a negative way, and we regret that, that we did those things. But researchers say that there is another kind of regret that is even worse than that, and that's the regret of missed opportunities. The things in our life as we look back and we see that, man, if we would have done that if we would have made that business deal or if we would have asked that girl out on a date or if we would have stepped out of our comfort zone in this situation or hadn't got injured in this or whatever it is, that if, if we would have done that, then, then how might our lives be different today? And, and researchers say that that kind of regret is often the hardest for us to manage and deal with in our life. Regret just kind of has a way of kind of sucking all the joy and the passion for living right out of us. And what I think is interesting and even fascinating about the book of Deuteronomy, especially chapter 8 that we're going to look at today, is that that's right where Moses finds himself. Moses finds himself in this season of regret. 
You see, in Moses' life in Exodus chapter 17, God speaks to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to strike that rock with your staff and water is going to flow. And so Moses is obedient and he strikes the rock with his staff and water flows. But in Numbers chapter 20, Moses finds himself in a similar kind of situation where this time God speaks to him and instead of striking the rock with the staff, God tells him to speak to it. And for whatever reason, Joseph, or not Joseph, Moses, in that moment in Numbers 20, makes this decision. He decides to go back to an old way of doing things and to try to be obedient to God through an old method. And so in Numbers chapter 20, Moses is disobedient to God because he strikes the rock with his staff rather than speaking to it. And here's what happens to Moses is that God then tells him because of his disobedience that he would not be able to enter into the promised land. And so we find Moses kind of in this moment where the people of Israel, this new generation of Israelites are are at the edge of the Jordan River, the bank of the Jordan, and on the other side of the Jordan is the promised land. And you've got this new generation standing here getting ready to walk into all that God has promised them. You've got this guy Moses who's got some regret in his life, but he does something that I think is pretty spectacular. That in this moment, standing in front of all these Israelites, able to see the promise, but he's not gonna be able to experience it, instead of him allowing the shame of regret to cause him to withdraw from the people that need him the most in one of the biggest moments of their lives, Moses gives them a pep talk. Moses gives them that kind of pre-game coach speech, hoping that as they begin to step into all that God has for them, that they can learn from his mistakes. I mean, can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine that moment for Moses, a guy that God has used so powerfully to bring the people of Israel from Egyptian slavery and bondage into a place of freedom, that all along there has been this promise that God was moving them towards, and now all of a sudden Moses is at the edge of the Jordan and he can see it. And he gives this speech to these Israelites And I want us to look at it today because their story is our story. That when you look at the people of Israel, that it represents the kind of life that we experience and how God wants to bring us out of a place of of slavery and bondage into a place of freedom and how God has a promise in all of our lives. And so as we read this text today in Deuteronomy chapter 8, I want you to put yourself on the bank. I want you to put yourself in the story, standing at the edge of all that God has promised you. And I want you to hear Moses' words, his words of wisdom, but his words of warning. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, here's what Moses kind of sets up this speech by saying. He says, says, listen, be careful. Be careful. This word careful in the original language means to to protect. It means to guard. And so what Moses is kind of laying out right here is is a principle. And he's saying, be careful to obey all the commands that I'm giving you. Like it's that It's that coach before the game that says, these are the kind of, these are the five things that we need to do today in this ball game in order to win the game. And that's what Moses is doing here. He says, be careful to obey all the commands that I've given you today. 
then, if you will, that you will live and multiply. And you'll enter and occupy the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors. In verse 2, he says, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with with manna. Um, Manna represents the, the seasons, the situations in our life that we didn't see a way, but God made a way. And here's what Moses is saying is that, that yes, he humbled you. Yes, you went through some difficulty and some challenge, but that he gave you manna, that he gave you a way, a supernatural way of food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. And look at this, he did it to teach you. People don't live by bread alone. And I love how Moses uses the word alone here. You see, the word bread kind of represents in our lives the material things that we often pursue. All the kind of ancillary things in our life that that, that we constantly pursue. And, And what Moses is telling them here is that we don't live by just that. He says material things might be a thing, but they don't need to be the thing. And here's what he says. He says, rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. He says, think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. Kind of like when your child reached up to try to touch the stove and you slapped your kid's hands away. You didn't slap your kid's hands away because you didn't love them. You slapped your kid's hands away because you did love them. Because there was some sort of pain or disaster or hurt that they couldn't see on their own, but you know that it's coming. And what Moses is saying here is that that we experience that in our own lives. That God is the is the parent that disciplines us, why? For our own good. Verse six, he says, so obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. And I love how he says that. In essence, what Moses is trying to help them understand is that your future reality doesn't have to be your present reality. That God has more. He has a promise in store for you. He says that promise is a good land of flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that that gush out and valleys and hills. That it's a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines and fig trees and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. That it's a land where Food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It's a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. Verse 10, he says, that when you've eaten your fill, in other words, when God blesses you, Moses tells them this, be sure to praise God the Lord your God, for the good land that he's given you. Watch this in verse 11. Moses says, that is the time. When's the time? The time when God begins to, to bless our life. Moses says, listen, that is the time that you've got to be careful. You've got to guard and you've got to protect. And he says, You've got to be careful. He tells them this. He says, beware that in your plenty, that as God begins to 
bless your finances, as God begins to bless your marriage, as God begins to bless your career, as all these things in your life all of a sudden that are so scattered are now beginning to come together, Moses says, beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, decrees that I'm giving you today. Verse 12, he says, for when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else in your life, he says it again, be careful. He says in verse 14, do not become proud at that time. The time that he begins to bless and things become more in order, don't become proud and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. In other words, Moses is saying that no matter where your life gets, as you step into the promised land and the blessing of God, no matter how far you get, don't lose sight of where God has brought you from. He says in verse 15, do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with his poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry that he gave you water from the rock, that he fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors, that he did this to humble you and to test you again for your own good. He did all of this. All of it, like all of the the difficulty that we face in life and the things that we kind of walk through that we wish we didn't have to walk through, he says that he did all of this so that you would never say that I've achieved, that I've achieved this wealth with my own strength and with my own energy. I don't know about you, but I do that sometimes. Do you do that sometimes? Like God begins to bless you and at some point you get to a place where you look back over the blessing and you begin to take credit for it? Moses says in verse 18, remember the Lord your God that he is the one who gives you the power to be successful. If you got your Bible, circle these words. It's important. In order to. In order to. Now, why does does God give you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant that he confirmed? In other words, it is for his kingdom. He has given you the power to have influence, to have wealth, to have things in your life, health and wholeness, not all about you, but for his kingdom purposes. Moses warns him in verse 19. He says, I assure you of this, a strong statement by a man who's been there and done that. He says, if you ever forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them. He says, you will certainly be destroyed. What does that look like for you and I today? It's, it's if we began to pursue other gods, like, like elevate other things in our life, give them a higher place of honor than the God that has saved us, Moses is saying, when we do that in our lives, ultimately, we will be destroyed. Now, if you're here last week, you remember that we talked a little bit about Adam and Eve, and we talked about um, uh, the idea of covering, and that, that um, 
that we all have a tendency to cover and we cover by different ways. And I, I shared with you last week that one of the ways that, that I cover when a moment gets kind of awkward, I cover with sarcastic humor, right? Like I gotta, gotta kind of gotta break up the moment. And, um, and so when we look at this word destroyed, um, I thought what was so interesting about that word, if you look at the original language, um, the way that you pronounce that word destroyed is ah bad. Like Moses is telling them in this moment that if you live a life that way, like if you live a life that God begins to bless you and you get over to the promised land and you begin to forget who he is and what he's done and begin to take all the credit for yourself, he's saying your life is eventually gonna become all bad, <laughs> All bad. Because when we do that in our life, when God begins to bless us and we begin to take credit for it, the friend, that's, that's how we lose it. Maybe you find yourself today in a season, a season where you feel kind of disconnected from God, a season where that passion and hunger for the things of God that you once had is, is not really there anymore. Maybe you find yourself in a season where you've been asking a lot of questions to God about why. Like, why are things happening the way they're happening? And why do I feel the way that I'm feeling? And I want to show you, I want to help you visualize what Moses is saying in these 20 verses with a diagram that I think will help us begin to identify how we get it, how we lose it, and if we've lost it, how we can get it back. Here's what I want you to see today, that in our journey with God, in our relationship with God, that it always begins at a place of humility. That you and I can't enter into a relationship with God until we come to a place of humility. It's a place where we begin to recognize that we can't save or help ourselves. We begin to recognize, as the Bible says, that the wages of sin is death. And so the very best that you and I have to offer is the absolute worst, which is eternal damnation because there's nothing that we can do in our lives. Good works isn't going to do it. Money's not going to do it. Being a good person isn't going to do it. But the only way that we can come into a right relationship with Jesus is by humbling ourselves, recognizing the fact that because of God's great love for us and Jesus' ultimate sacrifice on the cross, that you and I stand in this life with an opportunity of a lifetime. It's a choice, a choice between eternal life and eternal damnation. And here's the beautiful thing of getting to that place in your life. Getting to a place of humility in your life is because humility always leads to obedience. It leads to obedience. And the reason why it leads to obedience is because humility acknowledges the fact that he is the creator and I'm the creation. And at the end of the day, he knows better for my life. And so I'm gonna make the conscious decision that I'm gonna submit not just to the person of God, but to the ways of God. And when we begin to do that in our life, we humble ourselves we begin to step into a lifestyle of obedience. Obedience always opens the door to blessing. It opens the door to blessing in our life. In other words, when we go all in in our life with God, God goes all out. That verse in the Bible says immeasurably more, that God wants to do immeasurably more than we could ask, think, or imagine. It's a beautiful verse, 
And all of us would desire for that to be the case in our life, but desire doesn't get us there. Obedience does. Because we don't deserve God's blessing. But our obedience aligns our life to receive it. And when we find ourselves there, a life of humility that's being obedient and God beginning to bless, that is the it factor. And Moses is telling them in Deuteronomy 8 that how you respond in that season when God is blessing you makes a big difference. He says that our response to God's blessing should be, and that's what he's saying in in chapter 8, that it should be praise. Praise. Like even though our life's not perfect, even though I still have difficulties and challenges and things are still happening in my life that I'm trying to navigate, like I recognize that God has blessed me. I'm on this journey of humility and obedience, and so I'm going to return my praise to him. Praise is a heart. It's a heart position that recognizes that I don't deserve what I've got, that I didn't get this, that I didn't earn it, that I didn't do it, that it is all God. And Paul said it like this. He said, for from him and through him and for him are all things, all things. We praise God through singing. We praise God in our services through raising our hands. We, we praise God in the fact that we don't live a life just about us. We jump on a dream team so that we can make a difference in the lives of others. We, we praise God through leading small groups because we recognize that although we're not where we want to be yet, we're not where we used to be. And we want to help other people. We want to be the bridge that helps other people who are in a season of Egypt be able to step into a season of a promised land and freedom. And so we, we leverage our time, we leverage our gifting to make a difference. We praise God with our finances because we recognize that, that everything that I have belongs to him. That that is the true humble position of the heart is that God doesn't have just a portion of what I have. He has all that I have, that I am a steward of everything that he has blessed me with. At the end of the day, it's, it's giving God our all because Jesus gave his all. And I'm gonna tell you, friend, out of experience, that praise is like an escalator in the kingdom of God. It's an escalator because it will take you to levels that you can't go on your own. And when we live this way, what ends up happening in our life is it takes us back to the beginning. It takes us back to a place of humility. And in our life, that is the it cycle. That we surrender our life and our ways to God, that we step through into obedience and God begins to bless us and we take that blessing and we return it to him through praise. And as we return it to him through praise, it takes us to a place of humility again and we just keep going through that cycle over and over again. So how do we lose it? If that's the way that we get it, then how do we lose it. You know, our tendency in life is the same tendency that Moses is warning all of these Israelites about. That You and I have a tendency to, um, when God blesses us, to take the credit. We have a tendency to kind of get a big head or to brag about our talents, our abilities, to make our life and our successes and all of those things kind of about us. We 
we have this tendency, it's just the human nature because we are all naturally selfish, is the human nature is to be so focused on building our kingdom. And friend, what Moses is trying to help them understand and what I think God would have us understand in this season of our life is that the way that we lose it is when we choose pride instead of praise. When we walk this journey of humility and obedience and blessing, and instead of praising God for all that he's done, we choose pride. See, when we stop submitting to God, ultimately we start wandering from God. And when we began to take all the credit and all the glory for where our life is and what God has done, it leads you and I to a place that none of us want to go. This place is called a place of humiliation. Why humiliation? Because God knows that the only way that he can bring us back to a place of humility, the birthplace of blessing, is through humiliation. I'm not talking about like putting you up in front of a lot of people and embarrassing you in public. I'm talking about taking you to a place where you recognize that it's not about you. A place that you recognize that all your good works and all your influence and all that stuff, like, it's not about how good you are. It's not about how great and brilliant and smart and all of this stuff you are. It's about him. And so God allows us to go through the season in our life where he begins to break down in us the pride, begins to break down the things inside of us that think that we got it, we're doing it, it's all about us, like we're the best thing here on earth. Like he takes us into seasons like that. Maybe you're here today. And maybe my prayer leading up to this day is that today would be a light bulb moment for those of you that find yourself in a season of humiliation, a season where you've been asking all the questions, all the why questions. You've been wondering why nothing ever changes, wondering why it's the same old, same old, wondering why there's such a lack of passion towards God. And could it be that at some point along your journey with him, that at some point you stepped out of praise and into pride? Maybe there's some of you here today that you look at a diagram like this and you recognize that like the Holy Spirit in this moment is almost like a pat on the back. Like you can sense the Holy Spirit in this moment saying, well done. That your life hasn't been perfect, it's been difficult, there's been challenges, but well done, son, well done, daughter, that you have humbled yourself before me and that you have done your best to be obedient to me despite the difficulty. And that I've, I've blessed you in seasons and in every season that I've blessed you, you've returned your praise back to me. How do you stay in that kind of life, that kind of season? You continue to surrender your heart and your ways to God. But maybe there's a few of you But you walked in this door today. It's a miracle that you're even here. 
If you walked in this door today and your heart feels so dry and hardened, that the joy and the passion of life and living for God has just, it's faded away. And maybe today in this moment, God is beginning to illuminate within you the reason why. That maybe some, at some point along the way, you quit being obedient. Maybe at some point along the way, you begin to take credit for what God was doing in your life. Or at some point along the way, your life began to shift from God's purposes to your purposes. Friends, you're finding yourself in a season. It's an intentional season that God has designed to help you recognize that it's not about you and you can't do it on your own. It's an invitation, an invitation to a heart position of humility because God knows that humility is the birthplace to blessing. And so today in this holy moment, if you want to get it back, the only way that you can get it is through a heart of humility. Would you bow your head today and close your eyes? I believe God is speaking to some of you today. For the Bible says that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. How do you know the difference between condemnation and conviction, what you're feeling in this moment? Condemnation is always a, a feeling that pushes you down, that says you're not worthy, that this isn't for you, that God, this is your new reality, that, that God doesn't have anything for you, it pushes you down. But conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit is an invitation. It's an invitation for more. It's an invitation for better. That is the Holy Spirit in this moment shining the light on why your life is the way it is and inviting you into greater and deeper. Hey, thank you for watching today's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you're subscribed down below to stay up to date with all of Transformation Church's life-changing content. Make sure you like, comment, or even share if you enjoyed today's message and it had an impact on your life. You never know what one share can do to someone else's life forever. For all of our service times and service locations, make sure you check us out online at transformtlh.com. And hey, we would love to see your face in the place this Sunday.